On a recent evening at a home in Beverly Hills, a few moms gathered to enjoy food, friendship, and a few laughs. They do garnish incredibly well. Yes. But this was no ordinary potluck party. Vaporizer time. Welcome to the Beverly Hills Cannabis Club, a place where marijuana moms congregate to take a break from the stress of family life. So this is um, strawberry pop. Your hostess, the self-proclaimed Martha Stewart of marijuana, Cheryl Schumann. Cannabis not only made me a better mom, Cannabis made me a better human being. Yes. Cannabis made you a better mom? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, your, your, uh, your guide to becoming a better human being. Welcome back to the Steve Malsberg Show. And joining us uh, right now is the self-proclaimed Martha Stewart of uh, Cannabis, uh, Cheryl Schulman. Hello, Cheryl. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, it's my pleasure. All right, tell, tell everybody your your story. I mean, what led you to to uh, to go to uh, to marijuana? Well, I was a skeptic, like a lot of people, and in fact, one of those goody two shoes girls. It was 1996, and I was 36 years old before I tried cannabis. And um, I was going through a really bad depression at the time, a horrific divorce, and had an anxiety disorder as well as chronic pain issues and neurop uh, neuropathic pain from two car accidents. I was having seizures. So at that time, my doctors, including uh, my MD as well as my therapist, had me on a number of pills, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, pain pills, uh, Neurotin, Gabentin for the neuro neurological pain, as well as albuterol for my asthma, and then another uh, medication for my acute pulmonary histoplasmosis, which is a breathing uh, disorder. So I was in my therapist's office one day and I told him basically I'd lost the quality of life with my children. I went from being a coach for my children's uh, soccer team and softball teams and an active member of the PTA to not being able to get out of bed. So my doctor in 1996 looked at me and said uh, you should be aware that medical marijuana has just passed and it's legal now in the state of California. And he said, I personally, speaking for himself, he said that he used cannabis and found it uh, as a superior mood stabilizer for himself. And he also educated me about um, how it was really good for uh, neur neuropathy pain as well as seizures. So he had his own garden and rolled a joint for me, which I'd never smoked a cigarette. I didn't drink. I've never done illegal drugs of any kind. And it worked for me. So I used it for about a year and a half. I found it to be a far better mood stabilizer and worked better for me than my albuterol or other medications for my lung disorder. And it worked really well um, for chronic pain instead of the um, uh, opiates that uh, physicians have me on. Then fast forward to 2006, I was diagnosed with cancer and was told that I would not live past my birthday the following year. So I gathered my children together and organized a living trust. And then I found out about cannabis as a last resort. The doctors had, had exhausted pretty much everything that they could for me. And at the time, I was on 27 pharmaceuticals, bedridden on an intravenous morphine pump, and was in, unable to shower or have any quality of life. I had a catheter, couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. It was really a miserable existence. And then I reunited with a friend of mine whose uh, family member had grown a specific strain for seizures and then another strain for anti-tumor growth. And then I heard about a man in Nova Scotia by the name of Rick Simpson who had cured his own cancer um, by an extraction process uh, that was branded as Rick Simpson oil. And people from all across the world were rushing to meet this man in Nova Scotia. So at first I thought it might be an urban legend of some kind, but I did connect with uh, Rick Simpson as well as a number of doctors and endocannabinoid scientists that specialize in endocannabinoid medicines and research. And cannabis, at the end of the day, saved my life. It gave me a superior quality of life, and I went from being bedridden and on 27 pharmaceuticals to within uh, 90 days being able to go back to work full time. All right, that's a, I mean, that's a wonderful story. And certainly, if you're in the position you were in, especially with the cancer, uh, I mean, I would try anything as well. Um, what my problem is, is that watching that report and uh, hearing, you know, one of the mothers say that, uh, you know, 
she she was on this drug. She would take a, a, a one drug to be not depressed, and then she'd have to come down with Prozac to pick her up, and then Xanax to take her down. I mean, I don't know too many people who use an antidepressant and then have to come down from it with Xanax, but nonetheless, uh, and that her 10-year-old, uh, and maybe it's not the same person, but her 10-year-old would say, Mom, it's time, and that means it's time to do the cannabis. And if my 10-year-old says it's okay, then why can't it? Why don't adults just accept that? I mean, I, 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 the logic here, you know, using marijuana for anxiety, um, I, I just don't believe in that. I, I just think this is very dangerous. When you're in charge of a child, I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want someone on alcohol. And, and, and whether or not people give you approval, I doubt there's many people in our audience that would say, "Oh, you do, you do pot? Sure, I'll leave my child with you." I mean. It just, it just goes against every norm and every common sense fiber in my being uh, that I could think of. Well, as, as you describe it, I would have to agree with you. The sad thing about media is a lot of people don't understand what goes on the editing floor. The woman that you spoke of had a brain injury. And in fact, the cannabis that she used is a CBD cannabis strain, which is completely non-psychoactive. So... So in that particular case, and, and that's what's sad is because in that particular piece, which is Navy C 2020 piece, they edited a lot out. Every single woman in that particular video either had multiple sclerosis or brain injuries or cancer or liver disease, and they left that out to, to be able to fit into that program. So, you know, if, if that was all the information that I had to go on, I have to say I would agree. I certainly wouldn't want my children to be with anyone who is impaired. And we're not suggesting, and I certainly would never suggest that anyone use cannabis and be impaired with their children or anyone. I don't think anyone should be driving a vehicle if they're impaired, whether it be on cannabis or alcohol or pharmaceuticals. But what a lot of people don't realize, Steve, is the fact that cannabis was actually legal on our pharmacy shelves until 1937 and was used as directed by a doctor for a number of illnesses. And I truly believe that if used properly under the supervision of a doctor as prescribed by that doctor, I believe that cannabis is a much safer alternative than pharmaceuticals, tobacco, or alcohol. In fact, in this country alone, someone dies of a prescription drug overdose every single 19 minutes. And in the entire 3,500 year of history, even Dr. Sanjay Gupta would tell you that there has never, ever been one recorded overdose of cannabis. And that really comes to... Uh, well, 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 that's a little misleading, Cheryl, because, because cannabis isn't prescribed until most recently and in a few states. So to say that, you know, the, the number of people who use prescription drugs or whatever, uh, I'm, to say there's no, in recorded history, there's no example of anybody ever doing too much pot and, and, and overdosing. I mean, that may be true. It may not be true. How about the people who use pot? And then, and, and it's interesting that you call it cannabis as opposed to pot of marijuana. It seems to me you want to kind of mask, uh, you know, mask what you're doing a little bit. But also, you know, there are people who start with marijuana and wind up on cocaine and heroin. It's been shown to be a great gateway drug. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who had this epiphany and has not shut up about it for the past two or three weeks straight, every time he opens his mouth, all of a sudden he's apologizing after 30 years of going the other way and telling us, hey, you know, no one ever got, uh, no one, no one ever got uh, lung cancer from marijuana and no one ever overdosed from marijuana. And no one, how do you know? And how do you know whether people who smoke marijuana don't go to, to tougher drugs and harder drugs and die of overdoses that way? Well, um, you're wrong on a couple of things. First of all, cannabis is the true scientific name for the plant. Marijuana is a slang term. And as I said, cannabis was, be able, uh, was able to be purchased in our pharmacies until 1937. So there are a number of hundreds of years and even centuries that cannabis has been uh, researched and used throughout medical history. That's a proven fact. And when you state that cannabis is not recognized as any kind of a mood stabilizer, whether it be for anxiety or depression, I'll also beg to differ with that. In fact, the American Veterans Association just approved uh, for our veterans who come over from severe post-traumatic stress disorder to use cannabis in hospitals and have agreed, in fact, the American Medical Association agrees that cannabis does have medicinal value. But what about the long-term effects? Uh, we all know people who we could tell right away have been spot pot smokers for years. There is long-term effect on the brain. The medical research shows that. Again, you're not addressing the fact that it's a gateway drug. And, and what message does it send to, to the youth 
of our country. Uh, it, you know, if, if pot's okay, my mom does pot, it makes her better, makes her feel better, uh, you know, um, then what's wrong with a little pot at a party? Or what's wrong with the next uh, drug, the next step up? I just think it's a very bad uh, precedent to set. So address the gateway issue, address the brain effects on the long-term use issue. Absolutely. Well, first of all, in, in some ways, there are partial truths in what you say. For example, if a child starts using cannabis under the age of 21, you are correct. There have been studies that have shown that there have been some issues with uh, you know, memory development as, very, as well as cognitive skills. So I would agree with you on that. And in fact, as I said before, I do not advocate cannabis use for young children, except in the cases of, for example, the young child, Vivian Wilson, who's age two years old, and the young child named Charlotte in Denver. These are two young children that suffer from Dravet syndrome. And it's been proven in both cases that cannabis that is high in CBDs, which again is the non-psychoactive ingredient of the plant, have been shown repeatedly through their doctors and through their research in supervised studies. That is, it has reduced their seizures from 83 seizures per day to only three. And that's significant. Again, and a lot of people don't realize that there is cannabis that is completely non-psychoactive. Now, in addressing the gateway issue, I'm a firm believer that if someone has an addictive personality or a uh, predisposition to addiction, chances are the first thing that they tried was a cigarette and then beer and then pot and then cocaine or whatever other drugs that there are. There are a number of studies that show that alcohol, excuse me, that cannabis is far less addictive than alcohol, tobacco, or pharmaceuticals. And again, I go back to the fact that a recent study showed that what, someone dies in this country every 19 minutes of a prescription drug overdose. Now, as a mother who had children in high school, I will tell you that my children, when I spoke to them about my cannabis usage and being a legal cannabis patient, they told me that the biggest problem in their schools, and this was a very exclusive private school here in Los Angeles, they told me, both of them, that the biggest problem in today's schools are pharmaceutical pill parties, where the children go in, raid their parents' pharmaceutical cabinets, pour all of the pills into a big bowl, swirl it around, take a handful of pills, and then they see what happens. And that can be deadly. That can I, be Well, deadly. that's insane. Absolutely. No, that is insane. Look, this is an interesting issue. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the back and forth. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it apparently cured your cancer. And uh, that maybe it gives other people hope if there's a way for, uh, for that to happen. And uh, I, I thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me. It, it was a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Take care. Thank